Ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, it's a pleasure to address this forum on the heels of my recent visit to Iceland. In these troubling times, the leadership of Iceland and those of you here today remains a beacon of hope. In the midst of unspeakable suffering and loss of life in the ongoing conflicts in Israel and Gaza and around the world, we recently launched the hashtag Women for Peace campaign, a women-led campaign focused on standing in solidarity for peace at this time of escalating war and conflicts. Once again, women stand up for peace. Our message is clear, enough is enough, let us give peace a chance. The campaign brings together global leaders, including the Prime Minister of Iceland, the Prime Minister of Barbados, and UN Women's Executive Director, among many others, to amplify the voices of women and children caught in the crossfire and influence decision makers to create pathways for peace. Yet, for women's voices, voices to be heard and amplified, we must come together to remove barriers limiting our participation in decision-making and peace-building. Trends are showing we are not succeeding. There is a regression of women's rights across the globe. We have witnessed a dramatic 50% increase in the number of women and girls living in conflict-affected areas in the last six years. And where peace efforts are ongoing, women's participation is in decline. We must halt and reverse these trends. Multilateral cooperation is the only path to solving complex global challenges and meeting the goals of the United Nations Charter of peace, sustainable development and human rights for all people everywhere. To this end, the Secretary General's proposal for a new agenda for peace places the transformation of gendered power dynamics at the centre of this agenda. It calls for us to stand together, to take concrete action, to challenge gender norms and oppressive power structures that stand in the way of women's full, meaningful and equal participation in political and public life as foreseen in Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development and Africa Union's Agenda 2063. These are our blueprints for a peaceful and prosperous future. Ladies and gentlemen, sustainable development is our best prevention tool. Accelerating action to meet both agendas will require game-changing investments in key areas, from women's political participation and economic empowerment to their participation and ability to benefit from key transitions that are intrinsic to the SDGs, digital connectivity, the transformation of food systems, the shift towards clean renewable energy sources, and solutions at scale to address the triple crisis of climate biodiversity loss and pollution, and to see advancements in tandem in education, jobs and social protection, all stand as essential transitions to propel us towards the fulfillment of our SDGs. And none of these can be achieved without gender equality at the center. Ladies and gentlemen, to succeed, we must also enhance collaboration across sectors. Everyone's voices must be heard, civil society, grassroots organizations, farmers, feminist organizations, scholars, the scientific community, and so much more. Solutions must be rooted in the interests and concerns of women. We need an increase in resource allocation and a stronger alignment of our investments in the transformative potential of the women, peace, and security agenda. We need accountability anchored in data. Strong data systems can provide evidence to overturn assumptions based on gender bias as we strive to leave no one behind. Innovative use of data is exposing gender bias in all kinds of new areas. We need to make the most of statistical tools. As we approach the second half of the 2030 agenda, let us stand together in solidarity to provide the leadership, public and private investments, and comprehensive policy and legislative reforms that are needed to dismantle the systemic barriers to the achievement of gender equality and women's empowerment in the 2030 Agenda. Together, I believe we can build a future where everyone enjoys peace, prosperity and equal opportunities. Thank you. I sat here one year ago to talk about the war in Ukraine, to talk about the state of the world, thinking that the conflict in Ukraine was one of the most fundamental crises that we were facing, mm -hmm. and that it couldn't possibly get worse. And now we're sitting here one year ago with a new front opening in the Middle East uh, and the situation getting more and more dire. But there's also reasons to be optimistic. 
In 2024, half of the world is going to vote uh, in elections, um, and populations are going to decide what they want the world to look like. So today, I'm accompanied by very knowledgeable panelists to understand where we're going next and to take the pulse on the global situation. Uh, so, Martin, I want to start with you. Uh, you're the Secretary General of the Interparliamentary Union, so a lot of your constituents are going to be on the ballot next year. Uh, what we're witnessing globally is that there's a lack of trust in institutions. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit what your priorities and what your concerns are for the year to come? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me. I don't know if I was included in those 500 persons <laughs> that, were, <laughs> that were mentioned in the opening statements. But uh, uh, let's go to your question, uh, Stephanie. Next year, we're going to have some 40 to 45 uh, legislative elections. And uh, this is the average. It shows that elections continue to be the preferred model, modality for electing leaders and representatives. But there is a problem. When you talk about challenges, you are not talking about the principle of elections. You are talking of the electoral systems that are put in place. And next year, we are going to unfortunately see that elections will yield unequal parliamentary institutions because of the way those electoral processes have been uh, crafted. You know, when you look at the trends today, where women account for only 26.7% in parliament, or only one out of 10 uh, heads of state are women, or 22% cabinet ministers, then there's something wrong with our electoral systems that need to be fixed. And I go back to what Catherine, the prime minister, yes said, and that is we need political commitment, we need some degree of activism to correct that. And there are solutions that are out there that we can fall back on. Legislated quotas, voluntary quotas, education of women, leveling the playing field for women in electoral systems. I, when I, I talk about this, I feel a bit uncomfortable. I've just come from West Africa, where, as you know, there has been an epidemic of coup d'etats. And each of those military uh, rulers has established a transitional legislative body. And I do see that those bodies are more equal than those that come out of elections. So there's something wrong with our electoral systems that we need to correct uh, going forward. Yeah, and it, it's interesting when you look at the situations of elections and how people look at them, and also the situations inside countries, because when you look at also the global situations, you're seeing Western democracies being more and more divided from the inside. Uh, if we look at the situation in the Middle East, for example, so Irene, I want to turn to you uh, to take maybe a more of a, an international relations perspective. Um, so I'm sure you've been following the war in Ukraine closely and now the war in the Middle East. Uh, so at the NATO headquarters, what kind of concerns are you hearing about this conflict becoming regional, becoming global, uh, and what do you think can be done to avoid escalation? Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, to connect what you said at the beginning, we thought last year uh, that things could not go worse. I joined NATO uh, at the end of January, only a few weeks before the war started. So I enter in this domain, really focusing on the war uh, on Ukraine, and now, we see that things can get worse and we don't know where they're going and we all want to uh, avoid any escalation. So at NATO, we are closely monitoring the situation uh, and we to uh, really work with our partners. Israel has been a partner with, uh, uh, for NATO for the past 30 years, but it's not the only one. We have several partners in the region, Jordan, Egypt, uh, Bahrain. Uh, the King of Jordan came to NATO last week to discover the council and try to really um, work in synergy to avoid this, uh, this escalation. And that's extremely important to uh, avoid that uh, other actors take advantage of the situation. At the same time, uh, we keep um, our work with uh, Ukraine uh, to support them. 
And uh, for us, it's very important to uh, continue to uh, defend the eastern, the eastern flank of, uh, of the alliance. But what we see is that all the situation is interconnected. It's, it's clear that things do not happen in a vacuum, and this is why our approach at the alliance is to 360 uh, degrees. And when it comes to uh, how we can better support, we put in place mechanisms, especially with uh, Ukraine right now, because it's part of the on ongoing agreement we, we had. And at the last uh, summit in Vilnius, we took decision, the like head of states and government took decision to reinforce those mechanisms and to uh, enable uh, Ukraine to uh, win the war. And those mechanisms also involve uh, uh, women and the civilian population to make uh, sure that uh, their rights and uh, especially the participation in women in winning this war has, I mean, women have all the tools in place to uh, be part of this, uh, of this uh, fight. Thank you, Irene. Uh, and I want to turn to Obi on this because I think one thing Irene mentioned is that these conflicts, they're not in a vacuum, they're interconnected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm at the UN, I'm a UN correspondent, and when I'm witnessing dynamics, obviously, one very crucial dynamics when you're looking at votes, when you're looking at countries, is this so-called North-South divide. Mm -hmm. Even though North-South may not be the best terms to uh, define it, yes. but from that understanding, can you talk a little bit uh, what you're witnessing um, how can we bridge that gap? And do you feel like, are you seeing the world really, you know, becoming more and more divided and alliance uh, being formed? Thank you, Stephanie. And hello to my co-panelists. Mm -hmm. uh, hello to the women. Energy for the women. Energy. <laughs> so, we are back in the 1945 moment mm -hmm. in our world when it was clear that the world needed to collaborate. It was clear that the world needed a peaceful environment in order to achieve prosperity. And that's how the League of Nations, which became the United Nations, came about. We're back to that moment where clearly we're not able to solve global problems without fractionalization and factionalization of our world. We can't even get conversations around global problems that we need to solve. Climate change, terrorism, um, economic inequalities, um, desperate poverty in the midst of prosperity of a, a smaller segment of people. So it is that moment when leadership must arise and we're not finding the leadership globally i'm looking for the leaders mm -hmm. it's like something is off so what that suggests is that our multilateral system is completely unable ineffectual to solve today's problems and what we continue to do is pretend that we have mechanisms. Mm -hmm. These mechanisms are anachronistic, they are not inclusive, the women are outside of these mechanisms, the young people who own this century, not the older ones like us, are outside of these mechanisms. We are trying to determine solutions for a world we would not be part of. Mm -hmm. It's unfair. We do need to design a new set of multilateral rules that would be inclusive, that would be equitable, that would offer equal opportunity so that we can quickly solve these problems. They are not unsolvable. As we can see, greater integration and collaboration served us well as the world. What's going on is we have left politics to a few gentlemen. And that's, that's, that's what that produced the world we're in. A world that is so dissatisfying to the larger majority. Young people are not happy with our world. When you talk to young people today, they're just like, what's wrong with all of you? You've created too many problems for us, just go away. You talk to the women, 
They're wondering, when are these numbers going to make sense? And we continue to sort of feel like we need to appeal to a few of these ineffectual people who mostly come from one gender, and we are digging into situations where countries of the constructed South and the countries of the constructed North are unable to find ways to collaborate. And my sense of optimism is that one day, the women will wake up to the Iceland solution and just pour out into the world and say, let's have a conversation. Because that kind of a conversation will start the process of the redesign of the mechanisms, mechanisms that reflect the diversity that we are in our world today so that people can begin to work their way out of this current situation and then we would all begin to prosper because we know that it is possible to prosper, it is possible to be stable, it is possible to have peace, it is possible to, prov to provide the atmosphere for inclusive uh, relationship where people get a sense that they have a stake and that they are seen and that they are heard. Until that happens, we probably are going to struggle for a long time. But imagine this number of women grown into exponential numbers and saying we need to redesign mechanisms, starting from the OECD to G7, G8, or G20, whatever G it is. <laughs> Those Gs are not inclusive, and we need to have inclusive Gs. Adela, I am sure that after hearing our three other panelists, I'm sure you have a lot that you want to talk about. So you represented your country at the highest level before the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. Uh, but maybe to open up, I wanted to ask you about women's rights more globally, mm -hmm. what you're witnessing, what mm -hmm. your concerns are, mm -hmm. and if you share Obi's perspective that, <laughs> you know, if we did it the Icelandic way, maybe we'd find better solutions. Sure, thank you, Stephanie, and, and thank you for this invitation. And literally following up on what Obi said, I think we had a conversation last night around the same line, and, and I completely agree. Um, and we have been saying this, not this morning, I think, with the data that was proven and shared with us. Uh, we have been saying this for last year and a half, that there is a fallback. There is a fallback on the rights of women. There is a fallback on democracy. There is a fallback on all the liberal principles that we all believed, which came out of the uh, post-1945 period and era and I think a determination that we have to be together to do the right things. And I think there is a fallback on rights, period, everywhere. And I think it's very unfortunate at the core of all of this is women. Women and children, if it is in conflicts, if it starts with Ukraine, if it is in Afghanistan, if it is in the Middle East, at the core of all of this who pays the largest price is women and kids. And it is a moment, a moment of pause. And I think beyond pause, now a moment of action. Because we have been going in the circle and trying to be, um, either it's part of our feminine part uh, being either gentle, patient, um, with grace. And I think we have to go beyond that and be at the moment of action. Right? We don't have the time to redesign things. I, I believe it will take us forever. We don't have the moment to convince everybody else to come and join us and say, you know, we have to work harder because we are, try we are seeing things are falling apart in every front. I think it is a moment that we have to collectively, as women leaders, and when I say us and then, uh, men, kind men that also join, and if they don't join, it's okay. <laughs> we still can move forward. But it, it's, it's a moment that all of us have started to realize the confusion in the, um, 
and, and, and also a moment of challenge. We are here in the 21st century when technology has integrated, has brought our youth in the younger generation in a space that we do not have control over it, how they are educated. We are at the time when polarism has arrived and I was listening this morning and there was a moment I think the realization happened in the West about polarization. It was around 217 to 18, but it had started even before. And it's happening. It's, it's not even if we think it's one party versus another at the political leadership. I think every single party, their leaders are trying to respond to the populist drive and demand that is arriving. And we have to look into the core causes. And one of the causes really, truly, I think our younger generation is going on a path that uh, it is not as it was before. It's probably the education material that's arriving, or it is probably the type of technology they have access. But it's not that we have to curse technology. It's also, as women, we have to embrace technology and use it as a tool for us to help fight it better. And, and my call, my call as woman coming from Afghanistan, two years ago when the fall happened, I told everybody I lost my belief in every single system that we had on earth. <laughs> I thought it is not working and we are on the fall direction. But here I am. I pulled myself together. I look up. I move forward. Because in that hope didn't come from, from, from men. It really came from women. Wherever I looked, it was the woman of Afghanistan, it was women globally who brought us in the forefront and made sure we're not forgotten. And, and I think from that energy that I have, I wanted to call upon all of you. Look, I say volcano did not stop us. 500 of us are here. And, and we want to think and we want to take action. So it's not anymore a moment that we go back to our capitals and negotiate with our political leaders and say, let's work on gender equality. I think let's turn around. Let's say, let me do that. Let him be in the space that he feels comfortable. And, and I also want to remind all of us, I don't want to read about this uh, uh, forum and next five years and say, God, you know, we missed it. Then we still had a chance because I am a strong believer we are going in the wrong direction in every element of what made us to be different in the 21st century as a better century. I think there is a regression in every front and it, again, upon all of us to do it the right way and doing that is really taking the decision, not trying to convince others to follow. Thank you so much. So we're, so we're almost out of time, but I, what I would like you to do, you know, we talked about problems, but if we think about solution, can you give me maybe in one word, a few words, what keeps you hopeful um, for the future? Uh, Obi, would you want to start? In my continent, I have um, analytically uh, deciphered that there are three game changers. The three game changers for my continent uh, are uh, women, young people, and technology. These three things uh, create the impetus uh, for the kind of improvements that we look forward to. Uh, we need to improve governance on our continent. We haven't been well served uh, by the governmental systems, the political systems, like what um, my dear brother was saying. Democracy um, is uh, in a crisis globally, but it's even in worse crisis on my continent because uh, the, and the, the 90s saw a huge, a huge welcome of the democratic order after many decades, the lost decades of the 70s and the 80s, following the independence of most of the countries in the 60s, uh, the wave of democratization was so welcome. But as democracy failed to produce commensurate uh, dividends of uh, development, uh, the people began to sort of alienate uh, themselves from democracy because democracy got hijacked by a bunch of fellows who uh, decided to monopolize the democratic space 
both in terms of power as well as in terms of economic benefit. And so the larger population look at democracy and say, what has it done for us? And you see people sort of thinking that authoritarian models uh, so are better, you know. And so you would see people saying, oh, don't you think that China, which uh, that does not look at uh, democracy in the, in the liberal democracy perspective has done better, shouldn't we be emulating them? And I always say to them, well, we did have authoritarian models. They didn't also produce outcomes. Military rule, you know, you know that across our continent, didn't produce. So we can't be flinging from one end to the other. Uh, but what we can do is that we can, we can actually um, transform politically to the point where democracy properly so-called mm -hmm. with a cornerstone of accountability and transparency and the necessity to produce the right sets of policies and institutions and investments that lead to growth will become uh, you know, part of our own journey. And so ownership. So, so ownership, ownership of democracy. Okay, and, we'll and go then, for ownership and because we're out of time. Yeah. So I do want to make sure everybody also has their word. Right. So I'll go around. Irene, what, what gives you hopeful? For me, leadership remains uh, the key word. And I think it's important to connect it with technology and the generational uh, divide. And Thank you. Martin? I, th I think that there is a need to restore trust between the people, the citizens, and governing institutions. Yeah. And those governing institutions today in many countries are, seem to be illegitimate because of the way they have been put in place, but also failure to deliver on the expectations of the people. And there, I think women have a strong role to play. And we're talking about representation, not token representation, but substantive ones, which means that parliament should be seen as a gender sensitive institution where women have equal opportunity to deploy their full potential, where women feel safe, especially so as there's this onslaught against women politicians, women members of parliament, mm -hmm. by who, you know, and so we need to fight gender-based violence in politics with all the vigor that requires. So in, at the end of the day, we want to work hard to restore trust between the governed and the governors. Restoring trust. And Adela, last word. Sure. I think for me, the hope is really the woman. Uh, to be honest, it's, it's, and it, it is really woman in power. And it's not the usual woman leaders or the, f the, the, the format of the leader that usually you have in mind. I think the, the, the Nordic model, I think this was something today we, we spoke about it, that is, that is a greater awareness that we have, which helps us a lot, that where we are, we are in the worst place uh, in our history. But the, the uh, information that women leaders have, and then my hope is that they will take the step forward in the younger generation that will rely on the effective use of technology, which I hope we have a couple of panels coming in, and uh, we take up on that. So to me, it comes back to women and women's effective leadership. Thank you so much, Adela. Thank you, Obi, Martin, Irene. Thank you so much for your insight.